service here at New Life Church in Deland, Florida. We thank you for being with us here and uh, wherever else you might be. If you have not heard, I think this is the first time I've made the announcement from uh, the worship service. We are moving and we're moving into a really nice facility. Uh, it's a uh, chapel and uh, we are in the process of moving. You will notice that our murals are gone, and uh, we haven't quite figured out where they're going to go yet, but uh, anyway, they're gone. It reminds me of a movie that I, Fawn and I watched it, uh, Around the World in 80 Days. <laughs> uh, the very last scene where they're trying to make it back to England to win the wager, they're on a steamboat. And uh, it looks as though they're not going to make it because they have run out of fuel for the boilers, for the steam. So they start taking the boat apart and burning everything that they could get their hands on. Well, by the time they got to the shore of England, it was down to the water line. And that's the only thing that was left of the boat because they had uh, burned everything else for fuel. So that's what it's going to look like here for, for the next few weeks. Every time you turn us on, you're going to see one or two less things. Uh, but don't be afraid. The big thing that we are waiting on is uh, the Internet. Because uh, we will not uh, go without a service one week, even if it means we have to put off uh, a couple of weeks moving. Uh, you people that uh, are watching us at this moment have been loyal and uh, many of you have been supporting the church through prayers and through uh, finances and uh, we want to be very careful uh, just because we might be walking into high cotton to uh, not forget uh, those that have been loyal. So, and especially for those of you that, and I know that we have several, that are homebound and cannot get out of their house. So, do not have any worries or fear. Uh, the bottom line is, with everything going on, uh, you're number one. We, the whole church here, is supporting you that are homebound. Uh, that's how this ministry started. So we're not going to leave you, uh, and we're going to make sure that uh, no matter what happens, that, uh, that you are included. Having my notes here, we will continue to live stream. There will be no break in having a service online. Uh, this is a move of faith. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what we're doing, and sometimes that's the way God works. He keeps us on our toes. I think that's everything I want to say. Okay. Let's continue our service with uh, singing God's praises. Let's lift our voices this morning. Choose joy. We're here to worship. And we learned in our sermon a couple weeks ago that we are waiting on the Lord in everything we do. Let's wait on Him. Thank you. 
for today is Psalm 33. Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise is comely for the upright. Praise the Lord with harp, sing unto him with the psaltery and with an instrument of ten strings. Sing unto him a new song, play skillfully with a loud noise. That's good for us drummers, isn't it? Yes. Loud noise. For the word of the Lord is right, and all his words are done in truth. He loveth righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of his goodness of the Lord. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathereth the waters of the sea together as a heap, he layeth up the depth in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world 
stand in awe of him. Let us pray. Good morning, our most gracious, living, and loving God. With all of the wars, rumors of wars, going on in our world, with all of the confusion, worldly governments, corruption, with Satan attempting to fill our eyes and ears with untruths, Oh God, please remind us that you remain in charge and that you are fulfilling every promise that you have made. We only look to you for our truth. It is you that gives us purpose of life. It would seem that sometimes we spend too much time thinking about our enemies and their plans. So help us to see how you are working, not only in this world, but in our personal lives. We rejoice in believing that you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus, to take the place of our nature and our sin, and with him becoming the only acceptable sacrifice. This day we come to you formally and publicly to worship you and to proclaim that you are the one and only true God. We lift up those that are homebound, those that are ill in the hospital, prison, on duty as first responders, for the doctors, nurses, and hospital staff that become your hands for our healing for the military, for all Christian churches and their pastors, for Israel and her plight against Palestine. We know she is here until the end, but we're also told with persecution and suffering. Help us to help them in any way that we can, as a nation or as individuals. For it is in your Son, Jesus' name, that each of us does pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Hear our prayer.
I was just looking at a list of those that are viewing. Chip, uh, Gary says to say hi and good morning, Mom. <laughs> he calls his mother-in-law Mom. Aww. I'm going to tell you what I call mine. <laughs> <laughs> Richard Chandler. <laughs> I can say that because she's here. <laughs> <laughs> One of the uh, new additions we're going to have in our new church is a new altar set. Uh, it's going to be one of the nice looking brass uh, crosses with the brass candlesticks. Uh, and we will be able to replace uh, this homemade one that I uh, made. I think I made this one on our porch before. I had our uh, shop. So we will uh, be able to retire uh, this homemade one and get a, a real brass cross. Now, uh, we've already ordered it. And there is a cross and two candle holders. If you would like to give one of those three items, a candlestick or the cross, in memory or in honor of someone, then we will have a plaque put on it for that. Uh, can I ask you right offhand, honey, what uh, what was the cost of the cross? I don't know. Hundred and 
eighty dollars. And uh, the candlesticks were, uh, I think, seventy dollars a piece. Sounds about, Sounds about right. right. Sounds about right. I've overestimated a little bit, but that's okay. <laughs> so if you would like to do that, first come, first serve. You know, like when you go into a real church, you see that cross and altar set. <laughs> Church. What? We are well, a real church, Richard. Gosh, I just got reproved and <laughs> rebuked by the congregation. We are a real church. We are. Well, if you knew how long I had been praying for a sanctuary that has the appearances of being a real church. <laughs> The uh, title of today's sermon is uh, Fact Check. You've probably seen it on your uh, internet, on your Facebook, and somebody will post something, and then fact checkers will come in and uh, will say, no, I'm sorry, that's false. I don't know about you, but I have found in the past that they are not always correct and that they are very biased and very prejudiced towards their opinions. And many times they put in their opinions as facts. Our scripture is 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. We live in a world full of propaganda, half-truths, and just plain outright lies. False statements are presented by the media, by professors, by teachers, sad to say by pastors, and even by sometimes our trusted friends. Just recently it was reported by CNN, MSNBC, CBS, and NBC, and other news agencies as the irrefutable truth and with indisputable accuracy that in the current war in Israel that it was Israel that set off the first explosion next to a hospital in the Gaza Strip that took the life of and maimed many. Fact check. It's false. It's a lie. Now unequivocally proven without any shadow of any doubts. Propaganda from Hamas. One might think that the war in Israel and even in the Ukraine is about bullets, missiles, bombs, but these killing devices are secondary to the primary weapons of war, and that is propaganda, given and accepted as truth. Words of misinformation guiding us to false presumptions. The old adage is, if you tell a lie enough times, it will eventually become accepted as truth. I remember hearing this report for the first time, and I actually believed it. Now, you would think that as a pastor, that in knowing Israel, knowing the history of Israel, knowing the current politics and mindset and ethos, ethos of Jerusalem, that I would have immediately scoffed that off. But for a few moments, I believed it. I believed that Israel did that. 
even when members of Congress continue to this very moment have erroneous information on their websites, hate in their speeches, subtle snide remarks, and word salad responses when asked about the subject. When they're asked about babies being kidnapped, tortured, young women raped, and they just seem to not be able to have a clear answer. What's wrong with them? How in the world do you condone such activities? How can you just shove it aside? They're masters of deception. They're the devil in disguise. They're Satan in secret and evil in eloquent, waxed words. The techniques of worldly and secular persuasion have bled over, I sadly say, into the Christian faith. Sadly, we accept falsehoods as truth that God is away from God. Even the church, the Christian church is at doctrinal odds over accepted biblical truths. How many times have you and I become nauseated over the screaming misguided female that shoves her sign in your face? My body, my choice. Fact check. False. Your body, your body, body is on loan, your flesh, your blood, your organs is on loan from God to provide a shelter for your soul. Now that's a quote from the infamous Rick Chandler. <laughs> and it's so good I want to say it again. Your body is on loan. It's not yours. It's on loan from God to provide shelter for your soul. I back it up with Scripture. Romans 12, first two verses. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's not even above and beyond. It's just a given. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove that which is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I was, uh, you know, sometimes I think it might be a sin when I flip through Facebook <laughs> when I see some of the garbage on there. But I was flipping through this morning. I had uh, studied. I had all my notes together. I had the points of my prayer written down. And... Uh, I had about 30 minutes left before church service, so I just figured I'd sit back and relax and kind of unwind and get the pressure off and look at some things on Facebook. Should have been in prayer, shouldn't I? <laughs> but it gave me a good illustration, and I want to share the illustration with you. And this was a gentleman, I won't tell his name because he doesn't live too far from me. Uh, that uh, belongs to a church evidently and obviously. Uh, and he lists 10 reasons why instrumental music in worship is wrong. Well, I went down this list of 10 reasons that he gives and he backs it up with scripture. There's no command in the New Testament for Christians to use instruments of music in the worship of the church. 
Number two, he says that there's no example in the New Testament of a church, apostle, teacher, or any Christian ever using an instrument in worship. It is not a faith, therefore it is sin. It is going beyond that which is written. It violates the commands. Singing is commanded. The accompaniment of a musical instrument in addition to this command is therefore wrong. The use of the instrument in worship to God is a failure to abide in the doctrine of Christ. For those who use the instruments in worship reject the authority of Christ. It cannot be done in the name of Jesus. And it concludes, from the above evidences, the use of the instrument in worship is obviously not from heaven. So it must be from men. Well, he, uh, beside each one of those ten, he put a scripture. Well, you know, I'm by nature a cynic. So I said, well, I'm just going to look up this scripture and see how he's taking it out of context. It was not out of context. It had absolutely nothing <laughs> to do with the statement that he just made. He could have almost said something I shouldn't say. But he could have pulled that out of the air. Now how many people are going to read that without fact checking the scripture that he put beside it? It's garbage. It's false. There's no correlation. Plus, <laughs> I responded to him. With scripture? And I said, my friend, yes I did it with scripture. One of them was one of them we read this morning. <laughs> and I said, my friend, while you're at it, just take the Old Testament and throw it away. You know, in the Old Testament, when the Israelites were going across the desert, and at the end of each day, God gave them two commands. He said, Build a sanctuary. I mean, yeah, build a sanctuary. And uh, then secondly, uh, build an altar in that sanctuary. And then erect a tent. We've turned that around today. We build a tent. And then the sanctuary becomes second. You cannot, and one of the orders that God gave as they built that sanctuary, that uh, temple, uh, can't think of the word, tabernacle, in the desert. He gave them specifications, inches, feet, yards, height, width, depth, where the altar was to be replaced, be placed in the temple, in the tabernacle and even gave them a list of musical instruments to be used. Number one was drum. <laughs> no, I just lied to you about that. It's, it's on the list. <laughs> but I think it's down towards the bottom. <laughs> Symbols. I think that's uh, Psalm, I haven't looked that one up, but I think that's Psalm 150. It is? Okay. Fact check. If you hear something or somebody tells you something, don't believe it without checking on it. It's okay to be a cynical Christian. The prosperity preachers spew garbage with waxed words, shiny teeth, distorted and taken out of context. Scripture and hopping around the world in jet airplanes and limousines. They present their hellish wisdom as simple, easy to understand. Use phrases that tickle the ears, throwing in extra biblical revelation. You know that. God told me to tell you. 
Bible warns against adding or deleting one word of Scripture in the book of Revelation. One of the last things that it says. Sister Joyce Myers, who presents herself as a Bible teacher, gathers thousands, thousands of women in a humongous auditorium. And there's always a few henpecked pansy men there. And as she struts across the stage, I heard her. I watched the enemy. I watched the enemy. And she made this statement. And I'm in taking it in context. Did you know that Jesus was the first born again Christian? Now, friends, I don't know how in your world you can come closer to committing blasphemy than that very statement. That's right up there with taking the Lord's name in vain. Did you know that Jesus was the first born again Christian? And there's people out there swallowing that. Oh my gosh, I never knew that. Well, you need to take it and throw it away because it ain't true. She just removed Christ from the deity. If he became a born-again Christian, what happened to the theology, the doctrine, and the truth of him always being God? Why do you think he was born of a virgin? He's always been one-third of the Holy Trinity. even when he was on the cross. Here's what she did while her disciples, that's what I call them, that they swoon at her every word. But what it does in reality with a statement like this is that it brings Jesus down to the stupid, ignorant level, leaving these silly women feeling good about how Jesus is just like us. My friends, Jesus ain't like us. Jesus is the Son of God. He is the and only Savior for humanity. He may have been in the form of a man, but I assure you, he was always God and nothing less. Fact check. Oh, what about Brother Joel and Sister Oprah holding theological hands, bouncing down the road of self-righteousness, proclaiming there is more than one way to heaven? And they're not really sold on this idea of hell. Well, looking at the clock, it's about time to have lunch. I'm hungry. So right after service, I invite all of you to go to lunch with me. Where? We're going to meet behind Perkins at the dumpster and we will eat all of the discarded garbage at the same time flicking the flies off of our half-eaten hamburger and sipping on a drink with who knows what is floating around the top. That's what we do when we listen to theological garbage. This is the world of devil doctrine. As I said earlier, when someone says, God told me to tell you, if this statement is not in symmetry and context with orthodox theology, swat them with a fly swatter and get out of there just as fast as you can. Well, you'll have to if you swat them. The word of faith preachers, you know who they are. They're the ones that say, name it, claim it, enough faith, and you can speak anything into existence.
if you're a Christian, they say, with enough faith, you'll never get sick. If you do get sick, it's because of your lack of faith. May have used this illustration before, but I have walked in on a hospital room where some good self-righteous ladies hovering over the bed of a terminal Christian moments to live and them saying, if you'll just have enough faith, Can you imagine how devastating that was to that terminal person? Well, I tell you what I've told them, and I've told them many, many, I don't know exactly how many, I didn't count them, but I know that when I've been at the bedside of a terminally ill patient that is about to leave this world, I tell them, gosh, that's great. In some way, I envy you. You're getting ready to see Jesus. And you're getting ready to see something that I've never seen. God is getting ready to take you. I can't tell you how many times I've watched that patient lay there in that hospital bed and them go, that, my friends, is the truth. If you're a Christian, you'll never be poor. I guess I ain't a Christian. <laughs> Been poor my whole life and with money. If you're a Christian, you'll never have a problem with family relationships. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> well, back to our lunch behind Perkins. <laughs> For dessert, we can satisfy our sweet spiritual truth with Kenneth Copeland trying to convince us that just the other day he and Jesus were having a conversation. And this is what Jesus told Kenneth Copeland. You know what, Ken, baby? You're right, and I was wrong. He has said that on more than ten occasions. Now, how close is that to blasphemy? Fact check. All these lies are dressed up in a tuxedo ready for Hell's prom. Another infamous quote by the Right Reverend Chandler. We believe in God, just not what he says. Or we make up stuff as truth about things he never said. And that leads us into our next point. Isn't that funny how that works? God calls us to expose lies, so let's look at a few of these lies that can take us down the path of destruction. One of the biggest wars going on today won't be found in the news, but rather in the church. The LGBTQ, RSTU, VWXYZs, and the rest of the alphabet telling us that men having sex with other men is okay and natural. Well, they're right about one thing. That is natural. It is the nature of man. It is not godly. It is not supernatural, which God calls us to be. God calls us to transcend from this world into the next and not to have man's nature, but to adopt the nature of God. That's biblical. Well, just with me, thumb 
through just three scriptures. Leviticus, the 18th chapter, verse 22. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. Well, then we flip the page and we go over to chapter 20. And we look at verse 13. It says, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. Leviticus 20.13 goes on to say, If a man also lie with mankind, and he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be put upon them. Well, let's go over to the New Testament, Romans 1, verse 24. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie. I, did, I mean, did I mention to tell you I'm reading from the Bible? And worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up into vile affections for even their women did change the natural use into into that which is against nature and likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their own lust one toward another men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves oh gosh the recompense of the error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. You want to know what a reprobate mind is? That's when God leaves your conscience. No longer do you have a conscience. But you can think anything in the world you want to think and you will agree with yourself and say it's okay and you will feel good about it. That's being reprobate. Then there's the old cop out fact check when we become weak. Well, I guess God is just testing me. My, my, my. Found this in the Bible. <laughs> and it's, even I can understand it. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. I wonder what that means. <laughs> Could that mean that if we say that God is tempting us, that the Bible is saying, don't let us say that? For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. You see, yes, we are tested, but it's not God testing us, it's our faith that is being tested. Oh, poor Job, God tested him. No, God did not test Job. It was the devil who tested and tempted Job. Read your Bible. It was the faith of Job being tested. How many times did the devil say, you know, if you'll just praise me a little bit, all this will be gone. What did Job do? He held fast to his faith with sores on his body, with his friends rejecting him, with his wife taking him out to the corner of the property to rot. Don't you ever do that if I get sick. <laughs> Well, you know, God will never put more on me than what I can handle. 
Well, I tell you what, I opened up the Bible this week and I just found all kinds of stuff. <laughs> Listen to how they've taken that out of context. There hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer, that is, allow, you to be tempted above that which ye are able. And that's where people put a period. But the Bible doesn't. It puts a semicolon. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. It's not the same person who is laying the temptation on you as the one who has given you an escape. There's two people in this scripture. One is the devil and the other is God. Now you figure out which is which. I already know. We are all God's children. I don't have time to read it, but the whole chapter of Galatians 4. Yes, God does love everybody. Without exception, God loves everybody. But you become a child of God only after you sign the papers of adoption. And we are adopted. And the only way that we will ever be able to become joint heirs with Christ is to be His child. And the only way that we can be His child is to go in front of a judge and be adopted. You've got to repent and be born again. Well, Fact check. God helps those who help themselves. Bad theology. Well, I tell you what, if I'd have waited on myself to convict my own heart and my own conscience, I would still be in the world. But it was God that convicted me. And what that is saying when we say God helps those that help themselves is saying that works lead us in to salvation. Works has nothing to do with salvation. The only thing that has anything to do with salvation is grace. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's that's in the Bible too. Heaven, and, and please don't be offended by this one, and, and I know people that have said it are saying it in love and good intention, but it ain't the truth. Heaven must have needed another angel. Comforting. Comforting. And nice, but it's bad theology. You see, God doesn't need anything. God doesn't even need me. God doesn't need you. But by grace, by grace, a gift, He's called me to answer His call. Then we hear money is the root of all evil. Doesn't say that. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they've erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. All things are possible for those who believe we hear. This saying takes a lot of thought, but the truth is all things are possible for God whether you believe it or not. Well, everything happens for a reason, preacher. 
No, it doesn't. Telling someone this, as I just said a few moments ago, that's going through a tragedy or laying on their deathbed is more than awful. It is a spiritual crime. There is freedom of choice, and sometimes we just make plain bad decisions. And let's not count out what Satan is doing. Well, just for a little humor to break up what we're doing, then we want to talk about the apple in the garden. Genesis 3, 6 says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, there's no apple mentioned, took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. You see, the fruit here, the apple, is not a literal piece of fruits. It's information. It's data. It's seeing man's nature and accepting what is pleasant to the eyes and to the ears. And that's what Eve saw. She saw humanism. She saw carnalism. She saw pleasure. Three wise men, I don't have to tell you this. They were, we don't know how many wise men there were. The only thing it says is that there were three gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. I'm trying to hurry. I want you to hear this one. A, a whale swallowed Jonah. Not true. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. You see, a whale's stomach is about the same size as my fist. A whale lives on plankton that enters its mouth and goes out the other end. A whale's stomach is not big enough. Don't give out bad biblical information. But I want to tell you about a fish that's called a sturgeon. Archaeologists dug up the fossil, the skeleton of a sturgeon fish, and guess what they found out? That the, that the stomach of a sturgeon fish is big enough to hold a man. This too shall pass. Probably confused with 2 Corinthians 4. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Cleanliness is next to godliness. It's not in the Bible. It's nice to know. My mother used to use that phrase making me take a bath. <laughs> but it's not in the Bible. <laughs> Love the sinner, but hate the sin. This one goes a long ways back, but not to biblical times. I looked it up. It comes from 5th century. Augustine wrote, with love for mankind and hatred of sins. The Bible does not give us permission to love the sinner without presenting repentance and salvation and urging the sinner to turn around. Be of the world, but not of the world. Probably this came from when Paul was talking about I'm a Roman citizen and a Christian. So these have been just a few falsehoods. Some not so damaging, some very misleading in bad theology. And there continues another war, and it's not overseas or in the Middle East, but it's right here in our face with our personal beliefs. But God commendeth his love toward us that while you were yet, yet sinners, Christ died for you. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the full armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. You know the rest of that verse. Be careful on what you allow to enter into your beliefs. And I end with 1 Corinthians 
9 through 11. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate. Not talking about homosexuals. Talking about men that act like pansies. And boy, what is it? How come we're seeing more today than we've ever seen before? Have the guts to say that and recognize it. Nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortionists, nor none shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you are now washed. But ye are sanctified. But ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Worshiping with us. We enjoyed having you here as well as wherever you are. Uh, try to guess what articles you will not see next week uh, during worship service and see what's going to disappear <laughs> and uh, move to the new location. Uh, we are going to burn this down to the water line, but we will arrive in the promised land, I assure you, right on God's time. And now as Almighty God sits at the throne of heaven, through the grace of His Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.